Hi, everyone. Hi there. Welcome to the Melbourne School of Design at University of Melbourne. My name is Rory Hyde. I'm Associate Professor here in the School of Architecture, Building Planning. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, The Future of the Suburbs, uh, as part of Melbourne Design Week. Uh, I'd first like to start by uh, acknowledging that we're on Aboriginal land um, and that sovereignty has never been ceded. This is here in Parkville. We're on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country, all of it, land, sky, air, water, everything around us here is uh, Woiwurrung. Um, the people of this have maintained this country for millennia and continue to do so today. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, um, and any First Nations people who are here today. Uh, I'd also like to, um, I guess, uh, state that the university and us and the school and uh, the leadership here support the voice to parliament uh, and a yes vote. Uh, and I think it's important that we, um, uh, well, have those conversations uh, and uh, start to um, build momentum behind this because it's an important thing for First Peoples here in Australia. Um, so, I'm pleased to uh, have this conversation around the suburbs and we've got some great speakers to join us today. Uh, Vivek Submaranian, who's uh, from SRL, Paul Jones, OMA, Judy Bush uh, here from Melbourne Uni and Jane Homewood from the Department of Transport and Planning and that's me, Rory Hyde, from uh, here at Melbourne Uni. Um, the format today is I'm going to do a brief introduction set the kind of direction for the conversation, then we'll have 10 minute presentations from each of our speakers, and then we're gonna have a discussion and we'll also be taking questions from the audience. So uh, have a think of some good questions. Well, there are no bad questions, but there are statements which are not questions, so. Um, I'm gonna dive right in then. Take a seat, there's lots of, there's lots of seats down the front here, yeah. Um, Melbourne is the suburbs and the suburbs are Melbourne. An estimated 86% of uh, people in the city live in suburban areas um, and yet this vast expanse is largely overlooked by the architecture and design professions. Um, in fact, many architects have actively railed against it. Robin Boyd, 1970s, wrote that is it just that the Australian public clings to its depressing little boxes because it knows no better, has seen no better design. Gabriel Poole, the suburbs we're putting up are just bloody inhuman. How people live in them, I just don't know. And Glenn Merkett, our only Pritzker Prize winner here in Australia, says it's appalling housing, it's appalling spatially, it's not architecture, it's merchandise. As if to somehow excuse us architects of responsibility for this part of the city. Um, so we decry suburbia sameness, the apparent lack of culture, the sprawl, the cars, the air conditioners, and some architects even refuse to work there, claiming that it's bad for their portfolio. But are the suburbs finally coming into their own? We've seen a radical redrawing of the social and economic geography of Australian cities since 2020, as COVID forced many of us to work from home, hollowing out office towers in the city and refocusing our energies and existence on our immediate neighbourhoods. Um, even now, as many of us head back into the office, this experience has not been forgotten and people are seeking out more space, more light. Um, they're commuting fewer days in the week um, and real estate is surging in regional and suburban areas. So rather than dragging us all under, perhaps the suburbs could be the future. And in this, if this is true, then we may need to think about how they're designed. Um, instead of the current model of suburban development, which seems to indiscriminately chew up the landscape and doom huge parts of the city to car dependency and cultural isolation, could we imagine a new kind of suburb? And this was the, well, this was my uh, very, uh, sketch attempt and really the starting point for studio which I ran last year in partnership with 
um, Viv and with input from Judy and Paul and others uh, here at the Melbourne Uni as part of thesis. So this is some enthusiastic young people uh, exploring Sunbury um, out on Melbourne's fringes. Um, and we're, yeah, we did a few house visits, got inside some of these example homes, um, and this is where we're looking. Um, and really, this is what we're up against. So this is what passes as a town centre in these greenfield developments. Uh, petrol station, supermarket, fast food joint, and a doctor or a um, bakery or a chemist, if you're lucky. So our students took, and, and then surrounded by um, at-grade car parking. So our students took this as a, uh, as a provocation, as a starting point. Um, and throughout the semester, we tried to rethink what those town centres could be, to reimagine them as places which are socially inclusive, culturally interesting, economically viable, and um, uh, environmentally sustainable. So I'll, I'll take through a couple of quick examples some of the great student work. Um, Louis Horn was um, interested in returning the um, Western uh, grass plains to um, their, I guess, pre-colonised uh, state and to um, it, it come up with a scheme which was uh, about reflecting the sky and, and addressing the landscape. Um, Olivia Lowe conceived of a new town centre that was um, put animals and plants first rather than people. This is a fully sustainable design for, um, with little spaces to welcome in bats and bees and birds and uh, water birds and, all, and wetlands and everything. Uh, Tasha Handoko was inspired by Singapore and the um, shopping lanes there in a, in a different kind of city and thought, well, why couldn't we transplant this um, type of living where with a shop on the ground floor and a um, home upstairs so to, to create a kind of critical mass around these town centres, a, a population concentration which would um, bring energy throughout the day and not just uh, during opening hours. And then Nadine Al-Irani, she was interested in the big box stores and in the construction of things like your Bunnings and your um, super cheap autos and thought, well, what if we could have that? Let's, let's acknowledge and recognise the, the type of building that we have. Um, but in between, let's create some really beautiful public spaces and let's think about the, um, how people can intersect with these big architecture. A couple more. Mark McHenry was interested in um, how to deal with the car and parking and thinking ahead to when the car might become less uh, relied upon in these types of spaces. So this uh, black drawing here, the grid, taller gridded section, um, is designed to be an, a car park, but then as the cars are fewer, it can be converted into other uses, an office building or residential even. Uh, so thinking about um, adaptability in the future. And then uh, Nianta Sharma, she uh, created an urban plan for this area of Sunbury, which used the uh, Wurundjeri seasons, of which there are six, to orient you through different plantings and different um, flowerings throughout the year so that you can, it, the, the place would read like a kind of um, map of where you are and connect you to country. And all of that, um, I guess, brings us to the purpose of this session. I'm not going to try and steal too much of Paul's thunder, but um, we've got OMA, designing in the suburbs. What a peculiar thing to imagine. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm sure that's why many of you are here with the curiosity of what's going on. Um, so we've got Viv uh, from SRL who's commissioned OMA and we've got Paul who runs the Australia um, office of OMA here to present that project. Uh, and then we also have um, Judy and Jane who uh, hopefully can um, put, contextualise and interrogate this project and have a discussion around what it means for Melbourne or, or how do we design these places um, to be better. So that's all from me. Welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm going to hand over now to Paul. Come on down. So, uh, as I say, Paul Jones is director of the Australian Office of OMA here in, uh, in Brisbane. 
uh, and he's the lead designer of the Sunbury South Town Centre and the Willert Town Centre, um, both for SRL. Uh, prior to joining OMA um, in 2013, he had more than a decade of experience with the architect, uh, as an architect uh, at Donovan Hill in Brisbane. Please welcome Paul Jones. Thanks, Rory. And uh, thanks very much to, for attending on a Saturday afternoon. It's um, taking out some of your time, so hopefully there's some interesting conversation goes on. Um, this year I'm actually um, chair of duty, uh, uh, chair of uh, the juries on the, the Institute of Architects State Awards. Um, we had an award session last night. We're sort of going around the region, seeing all these projects, and uh, reminded, of course, Anna O'Gorman's image was up there. So she's one of the on the juries with us this year. So. Um, but my platform for the Institute's program, it just really, really reminds us about the, the breadth and depth of what architects do. And I think that this topic of conversation kind of forms part of it. You know, when you look at what's happening in that awards program, it's everything from kind of urban design and master planning right through to working out whether the waterproofing on a roof's going to work. It's a pretty diverse thing that we have to deal with. But in amongst that, we're also thought lead leaders. We, uh, as architects, we're often chairing volunteer groups on these sorts of topics you know, social inclusivity, environmental strategies, uh, the suburbs, these are hot topics within our uh, organisations that we all work. Um, so we're bringing something to the table well before they're of a policy uh, and, and well before they're even enacted in building codes and legislation. So I think as architects, we have that sort of luxury of being able to be a bit kind of utopian. And, and this kind of presentation day is a little bit about that, really. It's, I'm not presenting the projects, um, but what I did want to show um, kind of a couple of curiosities which might help to kind of seed the questions a bit later to be honest and some of the sort of propositions here are not necessarily about what um, uh, might even be realized so I guess we'll um, but we put them on the table and in our conversation with our client Viv's sitting here and he'll talk to a few things later on but um, uh, we certainly have a dialogue which is robust and very broad about what it is that we do in our profession and where it might be able to take his projects as a delivery of projects. Um, these couple of slides really just that we're in Australia doing bits and pieces. Um, uh, we've delivered the M Pavilion, the Perth Museum and we're currently working on Perth Concert Hall at the moment as well um, amongst some other things. Um, but we formally established here after the Perth Museum in 2021. I guess the first question is, what is going on here? Um, a sea of grey roofs, uh, what seem to be sort of maybe little open space. Um, and that's a, a typology which has this sort of, obviously we talk about the urban sprawl, you see in that image. And then we get into other typologies which we see in the, in the city as well, or in the suburbs. Um, but at least the top right image is one of those images that are kind of a bit disturbing. You go down a laneway and it's full of garage doors. And you know, what does that leave with us with? Um, we look further afield into these suburbs and we then look at types of uses that start to bring sort of a critical mass. Uh, we talk about town centres. I guess our observation in that has always been about the, the separation of uses on sites, that they're very siloed. How do you connect and act with these uses? And so there's multiple examples of, of that, not to say maybe it's good, but is it good? Is there other ways of dealing with that, of those uses? If I um, feel a bit obliged to show some Dutch examples, <laughs> um, precincts, community master plans, I think they have a very unique problem uh, in that the population, very similar to Australia, has uh, limited land. So they have to kind of like look for, they do have to look for innovations around what it is um, about how to improve density, how to increase density, how to provide amenity in both the public realm and also the typology um, of the housing that's offered. And we always talk about the missing middle in Australia and um, uh, you know, that first image of all those housing, you know, this is not a typology that exists in these contexts, but there's something to learn from these. So you can obviously see in this plan here in the sort of right-hand corner is, is an incredible kind of ground plane with a suite of various buildings that interact with that ground plane that, clearly makes the spaces between those buildings that are kind of interesting. And you know, in this example here, there's a whole range of different, um, within what's a community, a whole range of different precincts. And it's pretty clear just from the plans that you see here that there are a range of different housing typologies. They're probably sort of delivering the same kind of things. Um, 
basically housing for a certain scale of family or, or dweller. But the other things that you can start to note if you sort of dig deeper into these plans is if you look at the street networks, the open space networks, the dominance of the car uh, is not related to the house, but there's often pockets of parking where people are parking away and walking to their house. So you can see the open space within some of the sort of donut plans there. So there's clearly private and public realm differences. You can see the big open spaces for, for uh, other types of activity, uh, soccer, uh, sorry, soccer fields and so on. So there's diversity here, the dealing of the car, the clarity of the organisation, the differences in these typologies of, of the missing middle. They're not as scared of scale. Uh, I mean, the Borneo Sporenberg is kind of a very interesting project and certainly something to go and see. Um, it's probably very unique as a waterfront or a, a harbour redevelopment. Um, but clearly there's the ability to put different scales. There's no, there's no fear of putting large and small together. And in Borneo Sporenberg, uh, there, if I should kind of role play back to some of those early images of, of, of the Australian urban context, uh, some of their planning schemes made this particular one a uh, set, set of rules, of planning rules that made for a very eclectic mix of housing types. And, on, and individually, it meant that everyone had an individual, uh, able to bring individual character to their dwellings, but they held us all follow a set of rules. So on the mass, it kind of all works together almost homogeneously. But at another level, it all works uniquely and individually. And then getting back into the detail, when you get past those planning strategies and we look at the typologies of these types of dwellings, uh, there's some very unique uh, and interesting types of residential, the sorts of things we just don't tend to see here. And I'm always curious about how is that delivered? Why is it a place like this can deliver interesting differences? You, know, you might agree or disagree that they're good or bad or you don't like the character of it, but it does give people choices. Um, but what is it that allows these things to happen? Use and activation. Um, the timber house on one level looks very uniform, but if you kind of cut the section through this building, this is cultural, urban, commercial and residential all piled in together. And if you look at the social mix inside this, the way that it's procured where there's no fit out, there's a whole demographic differences between the occupants of the building. Anyone from students and renters through to occupiers that live in these as uh, socioeconomic differences are quite broad in this, in this typology. So this is probably an image you're familiar with and we've worked with Viv for quite some time. Um, and it'll go to the next steps of being procured and built. Um, but in the lead up to that, we, we did look at really this curiosity of what else can you bring to the site. And we had some planning uh, workshops with stakeholders, which was pretty interesting. And for us, a bit of a, a revelation, but it triggered the idea about what if you can put other things on this site. So these additional boxes are about teasing out the idea that you can put missing middle. You know, there's a whole demographic of people that do want to live in these places and they do want to have connection to this commun this, the, these community activities. This building is just not retail. It's a kind of kind of a, an array of different things which has commercial, but also has health and wellbeing, other community infrastructure, council infrastructure, things you need to do, and it's all there and can be um, readily accessible to those occupants. If I just look at adaptability and land yield, this is kind of the seed of that image that was put up there. I think the image before is kind of a you know, part of a stage, more of it be procured as we go along. And you might say it's a bit kooky, but I guess, um, what we were kind of really looking at was uh, really trying to rethink the way that this typology could evolve. Um, it kind of started about the sort of necessity of the ground plane to deal with a whole range of different functions. And it was pretty clear that we had to deal with a certain building type that was going to see this project commercially. So we put a whole layer or plate of commercial activation at the base. But the key thing that we initially, and this will probably never be realised, but the initial strategy was to put the car parking above all of that. That in fact that you didn't have to take up the ground plane with all of the car parking, the sea of bitumen, that we liberated that and that was placed on top of the buildings. But it, but it wasn't, that was just like a stage one. Stage two meant that those car parks could be then reconfigured and occupied as usable areas at a future date. So in the, the diagram we have a retail, we're calling a retail concourse, uh, the, but uh, if you look on the bottom image on the bottom left there, there is car parking stacked above some of those, that ground plane. And the other idea about making spaces between the buildings was important. The green space, why do we have to make buildings that are so internalised? 
people are always looking for comfort. Does it need to be in the form of air-conditioned, internalised spaces where you can't see the sky, you can't see the trees, you can't engage with it? What's wrong with sitting outside? I know Melbourne's got a very particular climate, but if we manage that well, we can still have good quality public spaces between buildings, as we do in any good city, and Melbourne's full of good public spaces. We can also do that in the suburbs if we are developing those spaces well, and not dominated necessarily by cars. So some of our imagery was about how do you make a good concourse, a place that people can kind of gather or circulate, connect to some of the community and urban needs that there are, that they can also connect to the outside and engage with that. So we kind of did a range of studies as well. It was about, you know, what is, because the car dominates a lot of our life, as we all know. Um, there's some great examples around the world and everyone who's an architect in the rooms probably knows the HDM project here, which has this sort of weird suite of different floor levels and it's a pretty clever building because it actually has a life as a car park, but in amongst it, you can basically drive to level six and also get out and do a bit of commercial, whatever you do. And they can clear it out and have events in there. We were playing with these uh, types of building shapes which actually offered these spaces between buildings. And they're still efficient, they're still workable, they're still able to be built. Uh, we played around with the way the ramps might work, the configuration of the floor plate, um, how we could plan that amongst uh, the bigger boxes that were required to, that are sort of part of the central commercial anchor, um, to kind of look at what we could yield out of that. So there's a kind of range of studies that we did. And just when you think it's not going to go anywhere, someone builds one. <laughs> so this is a realised project actually in an outer suburb of Brisbane. It's a car park. You can see the circular ramp. Floor to floors I mean it can be adapted to something else in the future. It's attached to rail. It's free. It's a piece of public amenity in the outer suburbs. You wouldn't expect to see it there. You wouldn't expect to see the scale of it. It's maybe got its flaws. It's not perfect. But I've got to say, it's a pretty good utopian view of where the satellite areas in this part of, in a part of our world would actually end up. Thank you. Sorry if that was too long. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, really great to see all that um, testing and thinking that you've done as part of the Sunbury project. Um, I will get this set up. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, invite uh, Vivek Savaranian, to, who is the um, founder, CEO, director of um, SRL, which are a um, property developer manager here in Melbourne, and the um, Commissioner of uh, Paul and of RMA. Uh, and Viv studied architecture at RMIT, and I know that because we studied there together. We did. <laughs> Welcome, Viv. Not very well, but we did. <laughs> Thanks. So, as Rory mentioned, um, uh, my I founded a business called. Uh, well, SRL stands for Sandhurst Retail and Logistics. Uh, so we're not the we're not the train people. Um, we are quite unique in our space. We develop, manage, and own um, retail, pretty much any commercial assets. So we're not developers. We we are long-term owners of, of what we what we what we do. Uh, commission architects like OMA to to, to do these. Um, I've personally been working exclusively in the suburbs in various capacities for over 15 years. The business has been around for probably six. Um, with complete deference, I feel like we have some level of authority to talk about it from uh, being an owner and an investor uh, in these spaces uh, and long-term care of these spaces. Um, the approach I'm going to give today is probably give five observations towards some of the questions Rory posed in his poster as opposed to making this a marketing spiel about what we do, because who really gives a shit about that? Um, so the first one is, um, ultimately we're talking about people's visions, um, and we're dealing with visions and plans for very large tracts of land over very large periods of time. So the example Laurie put up of Sunbury, PSP, if you add up all the structure plans around Sunbury, that equates to circa 10 million square metres of land that is going to be developed for 
growth for housing, for schools, for hospitals, for roads, for parks, for everything. How do you get that right? Doesn't matter if you get it right. Who tells you you got it wrong? Should we be concerned about how these things get played out? Because are they just lines on a piece of paper and blobs in a piece of paper at scale to one to a gazillion? Um, I don't have an answer for that. It's just uh, uh, an observation. Um, slightly controversially, the, the delivery of those visions is usually quite problematic. Um, we have authorities and if I'm allowed to tar and feather Rory, um, like the VPA, um, who are so negative and they fear the worst that they set rules for the worst case scenario, which allows no creativity. Um, we have designers uh, who don't understand or appreciate limitations and scale of what we're, what we're, what's actually going on. Um, we also have uh, what's put forward as counter narratives, um, possibly from the 60s that are, well, these days arguably not just conventional wisdom, slightly conservative in their, in their approach to how things should be planned. And we always think as planning just not evolved over 80 years, are we going to keep talking about the same stuff today? Um, to continue on that route. Um, so since 2006 in Victoria, there's been around about 60 suburbs created. Um, numerous PSPs, the structure plans, have also been gazetted. Um, we've heard it all before, suburbs are monotonous, they're dull, cars have strangled our way of life, there's no culture out there, blah, 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 blah. Um, if there are issues and if there are things to be done, our personal belief is that we have to do something about it, but you have to get involved instead of just talking about it. Um, we've had numerous uh, involvement with groups, um, be it architects like BVN, who pol politely, impolitely said the suburbs are bad branding for them. Um, Vic Health, who, while it's their remit to worry about people's health in growing areas, have not participated. Um, we've had Gertrude Contemporary, who turned down a, a million dollar donation to do things out in the suburbs because it was bad for their brand. I'm not making this up, I've got it all. Um, at the same time, we have great architects like Paul, who's willing to take a go. Um, ARM, Hassel, Fieldwork, these are some of the groups that we do work with. So, um, but again, if you want to play, you've got to put in. When I talk about commerce, I'm not talking about a budget. Um, those who know me uh, will know that I have very little patience or care for bean counters or spreadsheet jockeys who want to tell me what's feasible or credit and risk analysts at banks who want to determine what we can and can't do who have never done anything or put any skin in the game. So what I'm talking about is what gets done creates value. And that's important because the more we can talk about what value that creates, the more of that good stuff can be done. It's pretty simple maths. Um, and we feel there's always a bit of a lack of understanding on how important that value is, um, or more importantly, how it's actually understood. Uh, to conclude though, it's not all bad, and I don't want to come across as all negative, but it is the little things for us that we think matter the most. Um, we work in a space where we don't try to solve the world's big problems. We focus on what we can do. We get good people to work on things that they can do well and get them to do it really well. It's a great opportunity, and as Rory pointed out at the start about a lack of involvement, personally, I think in the architectural fraternity, there's a great opportunity here. The stat above there is 
basically what happens every time. And I think Melbourne has been growing for since 2006, circa 100,000 people a year. But that's what's required every time 100,000 people turn up. And there's an opportunity for any architect, designer, whatever, to actually have some meaningful impact. Um, that's it. Thanks, Viv. Um, always very provocative with your positions, and I appreciate the, I mean, the stats here on the screen, I think, for any architects coming through, and just your sense of the scale of that opportunity, if you were to focus on the suburbs, when few people seem to be, um, then there's lots to do, lots to be done, especially if you want to do it well. Um, I'll now introduce Judy Bush, Judy is a senior lecturer here in um, the uh, School of Design. At, sorry, I'm getting tangled up. Urban Planning here at University of Melbourne. Her research and teaching focuses on urban environmental policy and governance, urban nature-based solutions, biodiversity and climate change perspectives. Please welcome Judy Bush. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> Thanks, Rory, and um, thanks for the invitation to talk today. And so, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the nature bits of our cities. Um, so, first of all, I'd also like to acknowledge traditional custodians. Uh, as Rory said, we're on the land of the Wurundjeri people here. Um, Australia is an incredibly diverse and culturally rich place, and I pay my respect to um, traditional custodians across the, the country and um, uh, uh, we can learn a lot from their custodianship and care. So I wanted to start by, by uh, uh, asking the question, what's your favourite place in Melbourne or indeed in your hometown if you're not from Melbourne? And, and to, while you're listening to me talk and while you're listening to all of us talk, think about what the characteristics are that make that place great. Um, for me, a little patch of sky, some grass, some greenery, some nature is, is really important, as you can see from these photos that I've um, uh, shown here. So we know that nature Urban nature is really important for our well-being, and particularly so as we live in an increasingly urbanised planet with increasingly urban populations. Um, the centre photo there is, is kangaroo grass, what covered the western basalt plains of Melbourne and what, I think it was Louis, um, Rory, your student Louis. There's kangaroo grass outside my house, actually. Um, so, we know nature is important for our health and well-being. We know that nature in cities provides food growing, social and community spaces, recreation and breathing space. Didn't we experience that during COVID? It supports our capacity to be able to walk and cycle and get to public transport. It contributes um, uh, opportunities for children's play and children's adventures and we know that's super important for kids in their development. Uh, it provides urban water management and really importantly we're increasingly realising it provides um, urban cooling as our cities get hotter. But nature is not just for us. Uh, cities are really important for biodiversity. Cities provide habitat for biodiversity. Partly because uh, there are a lot of uh, nature resources in cities, sort of diverse, like garden, you know, home gardens and so on, that, that can provide a lot of different resources for biodiversity. But we're also increasingly um, hearing from research that threatened species live in urban areas and some threatened species are restricted to urban areas. So that means that we can't just assume that nature will be okay out of the city because some species are reliant on urban habitat. So therefore it's up to us to make sure that we continue to design and maintain our cities to create spaces for nature, for us and 
for biodiversity. And that means retaining trees in urban landscapes. So that's about um, making sure that we have space for old trees, uh, certainly in um, growth areas, in precinct structures and so on. We need to make sure that um, the, the trees are retained, as many trees as possible. And that's both about trees in biodiversity reserves, but it's also about scattered trees in streetscapes and pocket parks. Um, one of my students has recently been doing research in um, a, a growth area council, a, a um, new suburb that was developed 10 years ago. And she was looking to see how many of the trees that had been identified in the precinct structure planning were actually retained and were still in place and were looking healthy. And she found that a lot of trees were still um, surviving on. And in fact, she found some trees, some big old trees in, in this growth area suburb that had not been identified for retention, but clearly were retained. Uh, and uh, she found trees in little um, uh, traffic islands and so on. So we know that it's possible to retra retain trees and we know that um, uh, it's really important for habitat provision and for cooling our cities that we don't just have trees in big reserves, but that we also have trees throughout the urban um, fabric. And indeed, that we find ways to retain trees in our own backyards and gardens. So not just in the new suburbs that we're planning, um, maybe that final point is one of the biggest challenges as houses get bigger and, oop, there goes that big old tree. We also need to, of course, look at how we can establish trees in urban landscapes and we need to think about that across the development stages of, the, um, of, of urban development. So looking at precinct and street planning and design, ensuring that there is enough space for trees and thinking about both below ground space as well as above ground space. Then thinking about um, how those newly established trees are gonna uh, survive the construction process. Um, and so really being able to ensure their um, protection from damage or disturbance or vandalism. And then throughout the, the um, establishment and maintenance phase. So um, making sure that they have all the conditions for good growing. Um, and also, of course, thinking about not just current uh, climate, but also future climate in terms of which species we choose. So I've said the word climate. Uh, of course, we all know that climate change um, is already with us and uh, its impacts are um, uh, with us already and will continue. And we know that urban areas are impacted by um, climate change. So here in um, Melbourne, we know that we are impacted by um, urban heat, by bushfires, by sea level rise, by flooding, and so on. So Antonio Guterres, UN chief, said, our world needs climate action on all fronts, everything, everywhere, all at once. I would add, and everyone. So everything, everywhere, all of us, all at once. Um, so therefore, it's up to all of us to think about what our role is in, um, in addressing climate change and also in ensuring that we embed urban nature in our cities, established suburbs and beyond. Um, urban nature is important for our resilience and for the resilience of the environment. Cooler, greener, more resilient urban areas. Uh, urban nature can also absolutely underpin local connections and relationships, which we I know are important for resilience. And um, uh, nature, urban nature gives us the opportunity to develop our, our skills in nature stewardship. So uh, in planning our new suburbs and planning for our existing suburbs, we need to plan with and for nature. We need to consider changing climate conditions. We need to embed an ecology and biodiversity focus, not just see it as an add-on at the end. 
We need to local, localise approaches that bring together local knowledges, research and practice, and we need to foreground Indigenous knowledges and custodianship in that process. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. It's fantastic. Great to see all that thinking and how we can start to anticipate new climates. Big challenge. Um, I would now like to invite Jane Homewood. Jane Homewood is Executive Director of Integrated Transport Policy, Precincts and Innovation at the Department of Transport and Planning here in the Victorian Government. Um, before joining the government, Jane held roles at Urbis, at Frankston City Council, as well as undertaking a PhD here at the University of Melbourne, looking at the transformation of the city from the 1960s to the 1980s. Please welcome Jane Homewood. Thanks, Rory. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me and um, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on um, the land of the Wundjeri and I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and any Aboriginal people that we have here today. And I'll give an example of some change happening in the su suburbs, the new suburbs, a bit late, but um, in Wallen and Beveridge, if you head out on the Hume, a massive growth area that's being delivered at the moment. Um, the Wurundjeri um, identified that there was a very important swamp called, um, in their um, language, Barung Baluk wetland, um, but it was known as Hanna Swamp. It had been very um, uh, depleted and overgrazed. Uh, and in the current system that we have, a cultural heritage management plan is done at subdivision. So all the subdivision has been, the, the, the precinct has been laid out. And it just demonstrates, which is some work that DPC, Premier and Cabinet are doing now, to try and get that recognition much more upfront. So before we start to plan an area, the first thing we do is we consult with the Indigenous people because it makes complete sense, I'm sure, to all of you that you want to um, actually make the wetlands part of the PSP and use that because it was a flooding area. It was an area where birds gathered to feed. It became very important for Aboriginal people, both for water and food. And it was on the way where they make a, uh, it was on the tracks that they went to um, make incredibly important chisel tools that are found in Queensland, so you know, it's all connected. Um, the reason I put um, my PhD up there, which I did with Alan, thank you, was that one of the things that made me realise is that we're not using, uh, government is not working closely enough with tertiary institution students to actually come up with ideas to the significant um, problems that we have in our urban and regional environment. Um, so. I'll kind of ground us a bit. I'll just do a quick demographic snapshot of the challenges Victoria's place is um, and opportunities facing. Um, some spatial disadvantage maps, uh, the challenges ahead and the current discussions in government at the moment about planning reform and the new commitment by Minister Kilkenny and the Deputy Premier, um, Minister Allen, to really see how can we deliver at least 70% of our growth in um, established areas and up to 30% in our greenfield areas. So we need to, uh, with the current population projection, we need to build an one and a half million new homes by 2051, um, which is 55,000 homes a year with 15 of those in our 10 regional cities. Um, over the last five years, 44% of our new dwellings have been in established area with 56% in growth corridors, um, which is a, means we've got significant work to get uh, that turnaround to get at least 70% in growth areas. Uh, in growth areas, councils report much greater dwelling density than planned and larger households with higher car ownership than planned, which is resulting, which we, any of you listening on the radio over the last few weeks, a much um, 
a big gap between infrastructure being delivered, um, whether it's schools, roads, community centres, um, with that housing. Um, in Tarnit, which is to the west, um, as you head on the um, road to Geelong, the council reports that the PSP, which is the plan that lays out the suburb, the new suburbs that have been created, um, 10,192 dwellings and a population of 28,000 were planned. And that was at around 2.8 people per household. And in 2021, there were nearly 12,000 houses were built with a population of 40,000. And they are predicting a total of 16,000 dwellings with 55,000 people. Um, the PSP was planned for that 10,000 dwellings and a population of 28,000. Um, of course, the populations change in the PSPs as families form and grow, and then people, the children move out in a you know, typical house, but that's a big gap. And then we've got to be able to have mechanisms to retro retrofit those PSPs. Um, in 20, from 2026 to 56, um, 29% of Victorians will be over 65 and they're wanting to downsize from their detached dwellings. And 51 to 53.7% of Victorian households will be couple only or lone households. Um, and in uh, the 2021 census, 70% of our houses were separate houses, 13% were townhouses, 16% were apartments, and there were a million empty houses on census night. So again, the job of all of you and all of us in the planning and development industry is how do we move to have housing that meets our population needs? And um, I can see many younger people than me in the audience, how are we gonna provide affordable housing in well-located areas? Um, this is just a map. So the red shows the most disadvantaged communities um, and then to blue, the least disadvantaged. And you can see there are some real um, concentrations of disadvantage in those Western areas. Um, CIFA looks at um, economic uh, health and wellbeing indicators. And that's why it's so important that our new suburbs provide opportunities to walk, um, to provide the, what, what in um, the state government, we call that 20 minute neighbourhood, to be able to walk locally, good access to open space, um, to um, minimise trips in cars. Um, uh, I don't know if any of you went to Greg Clark's lecture this week, but he's really saying the real shift in planning now is the need to plan around transit orientated development. So, where are the opportunities around our train stations, along our transport corridors, um, where we can really uplift the population growth and make sure that our, our residents have good access to activity centres, local schools, local jobs. Um, and uh, the other issue that I raised is that we've really got a crisis in terms of uh, delivering housing at cost for residents. And that's been exacerbated, as you would have seen, by Porter Davis and some other companies um, going under because of the lack of trades and the lack of um, supply of goods and materials, and those are escalating. Um, so some ideas around delivering 70-30. Um, this is some um, ideas that I came up with Dan Hill in the MSD, so part of that partnership with the Melbourne School of Design, how can we collaborate? And uh, so we need some really good, as Robin Boyd was saying, some fantastic exa examples of housing typologies. So the new kinds of houses that we can put in our established areas and build on the amenity of those established areas. Um, and provide the kind of housing stock that meets our housing demographic. Construction innovation, so we have very little prefabrication. Um, so we are finding, you might have heard about the cladding instance, we really need to be ensured that our housing um, and our building materials are of a high quality, they meet our um, ESD targets. And um, so there's a lot of work to be done to see how we can 
um, develop the prefabrication market so we can simplify construction but we can also ensure its quality. Um, how can we support our infrastructures in regional and local transport and reduce our car dependency and provide those energy, water waste and nature-based infrastructures um, to thrive? Um, there's a lot of discussion um, about planning reform. So uh, if you apply for a, um, a, a planning permit and you get caught up at VCAT, it can be anywhere from up to 18 months to get your permit approved. So what are the ways that we can um, fasten that planning process but ensure that we get good outcomes? And how do we engage with the public? Um, so they're those ideas. Um, new South Wales has been doing some fantastic work in their new greenfield areas in high density transit orientated development and in the existing suburbs. So they're focusing their high density development around train stations. Um, they are looking at much higher densities in their greenfield because we need those densities to be able to um, make the bus, fast bus, um, public transport viable, um, increase diversity and affordable and some, provide some standard housing typologies. Importantly, increase the open space and tree canopy. And one of the things we I really encourage the university is to go out to some of those suburbs that were built in the 80s. And a huge opportunity is how can we improve and retrofit those suburbs, some of them without footpaths, without a tree in a backyard and really poor um, energy um, or ESD outcomes on those houses. So there's a lot of work to go back to some of those suburbs and see how we can improve them. Um, and as previously ra raised, making them mixed use. So it's going to be tough to get jobs in the outer suburbs, but we want to reduce the number of hours people have to spend in their cars and also with our radial transport system. We've got lots of people coming into the city. How can we use that reverse commute? So we've got empty trains going out to the suburbs. How can we have people going to jobs or activities and using that um, really important uh, infrastructure and leverage as much as we can from transit? Um, so some these are some ideas from New South Wales, but I've also added some examples in Victoria as we think about what we can do to get better, more livable communities. So um, leveraging our public transport system is one of the most important things we can do. How can we build on our existing urban assets? So there's a great example of an aged housing um, development that was built on Denmark Street in Kew, and there are about 300 objections. And then when they went out to tender uh, and went out to sell those properties, almost all of the people came from the local community. So how do we rail against, and I love the yes in my back, backyard, how do we enable people to age in place but move into more affordable, lower cost housing at a scale that meets that those needs as you get older and free up so many of those 600 square lots that are really valued and suitable for families, but can we get more yield out of those so that we can um, offer that great amenity in those established suburbs to younger people and uh, uh, newcomers to uh, Victoria. Um, making space in the miss missing middle, so finer grain place-based rezoning, unlocking sites of medium density where there are high levels of amenity, leveraging it existing infrastructure at scale and support a diversity of housing. Um, New South Wales has a whole lot of code assessed townhouses, manor houses, second dwellings in backyards. So that's something we're really keen to look at in Victoria. Um, and density and amenity. Amenity is more than transport. It's got to be covered, coupled with those open and civic spaces, a mix of uses, including retail, office and recreation. And to Judy's point, there's so much work now saying, you know, we've got to get people out of out more in nature. It is so good for our health and well-being. And that's it. Thanks, Jack. 
Um, I'll invite all the speakers then to um, have a seat. I'm just going to change the slide quickly. I might just reorganise the chairs a little bit. Thanks, everyone. Uh, really um, great to see all these different ideas and examples and thinking that's happening in this space. Um, I, I'll do a quick summary of, I guess, what the, some of the ideas are that we've heard and then we'll, I might jump into a couple of questions and then, as I say, we'll open up to the audience as well pretty soon. Um, so, uh, Paul, well, you presented I guess some examples from the Netherlands and looking at different typologies which are you know really I think radical to our eyes here compared to what we're building out in the growth areas and then also how you're addressing um, Viv's brief to, to consider a town centre, a shopping centre in um, Sunbury and in, in Wallert, how you can make that a real place by introducing other programs not just retail. Dealing with the cars is a, is a major challenge whether we're talking about housing or shopping centres or anything. Um, so thank you, fantastic and really exciting to see behind the scenes a little bit into the thinking that's happening in your office. I love a blue foam massing model. <laughs> um, and Viv, we heard from you and the thinking I guess that you bring to this space as a client, as a commissioner and as um, somebody who owns and operates these with a commercial reality um, and some of the, I guess, uh, challenges that you face in trying to do things differently. You know, we, I'm sure from your business model it would be much easier if you took the um, PSP. We've got to clarify some jar jargon as well. That is a precinct structure plan, which is the drawing that the uh, government gives to somebody like a private developer who then realises that, uh, you know, design in those areas. Is that a fair description? Anyway, so yeah, what are the challenges to, to changing those PSPs or to doing them differently or doing them better? And I think that's, um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about design and the, and the role of design and leading with design, we need to address some of those um, barriers as well. Um, Judy, very clear, powerful presentation on the importance of nature in our lives, in our cities, and also for um, all other species that uh, we cohabit in cities with. Um, and yeah, those really fundamental challenges of how to retain big trees. Um, and you know, these are things which, you know, you might, houses turn over every five or 10 years, but those trees can be there for a century and who's looking after them, who's looking out for them and what are the ways that we can, um, I guess, build those into our lives and cities. And then Jane, thank you to bring us home there with some, um, well, I mean, I think quite startling demographics of what we're talking about here. You know, t the, the, what was projected and what was delivered or what the reality is of Tarnit is twice the number of people. And you hear about, you know, queuing for an hour just to get out of their housing estates. I mean, the, the challenges around just managing this scale is are enormous. And I think that, you know, that's something where I, I, I wanted to start actually for everyone is, um, you know, it's very, it's very, I was trained in, in architecture and you're given a site and you can do things really well and you can plan things and you can think about setback and materials and, but then we're talking about hundreds of thousands of homes um, every year, uh, really. So, uh, or tens of thousands every year and hundreds of thousands projected for the next decade. Um, how do we operate at scale? How do we, how do we do those two things? How do, do we need new forms of practice? or new ways of, of planning or new positions or new, um, I guess, public advocates to, to try to shift the way that, because it doesn't feel like as, a, as planning and architecture disciplines, we're able to grapple with this, with the challenge, the scale of the challenge out there. So I don't know who wants to grab hold of that one first. You go over in the back. Sorry. Jane. Does that work? Yeah. Uh, so, just quickly, so I think 17,500 dwellings were delivered in 21 in the peak. So there was the $60,000 that was given to new home buyers caused a massive increase in purchases. And that's why we've had people like Porter Davis. They were locked into a price and then materials went up and it was really hard to get trades um, and uh, they'd overextended themselves. But uh, I think from um, the School of Design at Melbourne, you know, the more we can engage with students to help us solve the problem of retrofitting 
suburbs where you've got single owners um, lot by lot but you need if we are going to go back and put in footpaths and get greater density um, it, I think it's it's a it's a wicked problem that we need all our brains to um, apply to um, and particularly from a climate change perspective um, Jordan Krugnali is the local member for Bass and she was door knocking um, in uh, Cranbourne and there was a woman with a couple of kids. It was 35 outside, 40 degrees in the house. There weren't footpaths, there weren't local jobs. You know, we've got a lot of work. And, and I think Greg Clark, when he spoke to, you know, he said, you still have zoning? Everything's got to be mixed use, right? Now, I think, yes, we need to have mixed use to provide more productive neighbourhoods. And he was saying, you know, industry should be clean, so it should be part of it. But perhaps that's our opportunity. I'd love, from a development point of view, could we go back and rebuild some of those shopping centres to get that density? Um, yeah. Thanks, Jane. <clears throat> um, Viv or Paul, modes of practice. I mean, you've both advocated for getting involved in these spaces where many architects, as we've heard, do not. Um, how do we, I guess, encourage students here or? other practices to you know give as much attention to these spaces um, as we do for a inner city site or a museum or a yeah. um, gallery I, th I think we've had the answer in his presentation really about just being involved in it I mean yeah. like anything it's a project that's got a brief there's some statistics around it and you can kind of like overthink it but you've kind of got to put sort of propositions down on paper to make some sort of difference and I think that's our area of interest we'd rather be involved in the suburbs uh, we're challenging the typologies of projects that we're putting on the table um, are, are challenging to the client but we are trying to innovate through those um, design processes so we're not taking business as usual we're looking at what's built out there we're saying well if you did that what could we do that would be a counterpoint to that that might make a difference um, uh, so that's starting point just simply just rolling up your sleeves and start working with it. And is it, for you as a designer, is there a difference in how you approach those projects or do you um, bring that same analytical attitude that you would from the office to any brief that comes in, no matter oh, that's pretty. I mean, we're, yeah. our process, a design-based approach, yeah, so our office starts with a process of research, investigation, understanding the problem. From that yields, uh, you know, so we're looking at typologies around the world. We're um, looking at the problem at hand in the actual specific site. The, so there's a whole lot of factors which go into us actually trying to understand the problem before we launch into the solutions. And then our design process, again, um, explores. We don't just kind of like uh, latch on, and a bit would know this very well, we don't just latch on to a single solution. We haven't come up with these solutions just by, um, you know, one afternoon. Um, it goes through a series of processes where testing different typologies of things and in that case we're really the testing of typologies means that we're actually exploring different possibilities we're, we're not necessarily trying to innovate I wouldn't say but we are trying to find something that um, might be unique um, bring a point of difference to the project which solves these kind of issues I might ask you Viv how this um all started. I mean, what gave you the, uh, the the idea, the crazy idea, to invite OMA, Rem Kulas, and his practice to look at Melbourne suburbs? Um, to put it bluntly, nobody else returned my phone call, <laughs> or emails, or knocks on doors. Or... Is this on? Yeah, you just got to hold it a bit closer. Oh, or, yeah, yeah if no one returned my phone calls, emails, knocks on doors. Look, I've got a personal philosophy of if you do, you don't get unless you ask. So um, uh, I've got sort of, uh, despite probably the differences in delivery, I will say that I think there's a lot of things that Jane said that, 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 that from a professional level we acknowledge as well. Um, so <clears throat> there was, you know, it wasn't just the case that we wanted someone different or quote unquote cool to work on it. There was, after working in the space for so long, we identify there were some significant things that need to be looked at, not purely from a development play, but from an ownership 
play. So, you know, we stick around after the ribbons cut. So if we're going to own the asset, there's some significant things that we need to look at. And, and OMA tick the boxes, but unfortunately, um, there's not much, in, as you pointed out, generally not much engagement. Um, uh, and, and then to go back to your first question about how does a practice work or whether it, all I'll say is um, traditionally the PSPs, so the, P, the PSPs are the over reaching, overarching document that dictate pretty much everything that goes out in these growth areas or new suburbs. Um, I don't know if Jane agrees, but they, they are predominantly a, a planning and a lawyer's and, and a government space. They're not an architecture space. Well, they're not in the realm of architects generally. So, um, and that's probably due to the scale and the size of what's going on. So I think one thing for one way designers or architects or anyone could, could get involved in it is simply reading PSPs and, and trying to decipher them and getting involved in them. Um, the way we've worked with Paul or with actually with anyone we work with is that we expose them to the PSP quite early on in the piece and we don't try to do things different to it, we try to do things better. So they all have requirements and guidelines and it's putting the design smarts at play and say, how can you make this better than just the boilerplate requirements? That all starts with designers and architects actually taking the time to read through those documents. Now, I won't shock anyone in here by saying they are mindlessly boring and dense and contradictory and just dense, but um, there's opportunities when, you know, there's a 300 page document written by numerous stakeholders uh, to find ways to, you know, do something better. I, I remember when we, when we were running this studio, um, it, we talked about how to, you know, invite the students into the process, how do we engage them with these places? And you said, well, just give them the PSP. <laughs> and it's like, here's the URL. It, they, the government upload them all onto their website. You can just go through, there's hundreds of them, you download them, it's zooming through the maps, it's all there for you. And exactly as you say, you know, it, it, there's not, there doesn't seem to be much design intelligence I embedded in them, but they are trying to wrestle with huge scales and times and p numbers of people. So if you can make sense of it and use that creatively and interpret it, there's a, yeah, it's a great starting point. I thought they were great design briefs just sitting there in, in sort of hidden in plain sight. Yeah, I mean, I've always joked that any architect's office that has a business development manager should just be on the VPA's website. Yeah, that's because right. There's lots future of future pipeline is there. Yeah. Um, Judy, I loved your opening question to everyone here, which is what makes a good place, you know, and, and I think to zoom out and to um, think about those fundamentals of, of what type of a city we want to live in or what type of a suburb we want to live in and what the um, characteristics or qualities are is a really important starting point. And it's also something which I think can engage uh, everyone. You know, it's not just something which professionals like us can, uh, you know, need to, or are allowed to think about, but it's something that we're all invited to think about. And that's one of the other um, aspects to this, to this, I guess, when we're talking about different models of practice is how do we work with communities? How do we engage with the public? How do we have an open conversation rather than something which is, I guess, fought out in uh, obscure PDFs and legal documents? So but um, it'd be great if you could talk about those other um, approaches to planning which are more participatory, yeah. I feel like that's a question for Jane almost. <laughs> Maybe it's a conversation between <laughs> us. Um, I think one of the challenges in um, consulting about, you know, planning for future suburbs is uh, there's not an existing community there. So how do you consult with the residents when they don't yet exist? Um, also, how do you ask the, the nature bits of those areas <laughs> what they think as well? Um, uh, of course, um, understanding as Jane reinforced First Nations perspectives and aspirations for country and knowledge of country 
um, is critically important at that early stage to its, its foundational knowledge. Um, so, uh, and I think also, look, in my research, I think local governments um, see themselves also uh, as stewards of, of their new areas. Um, I think some of the work they've done in terms of mapping, auditing trees, existing trees in, in areas to be developed to really look at the, the um, state of the trees and the health of the trees and, and think about which can be and should be retained. Um, so I suppose it's, it's really acknowledging the range of, of knowledges that need to be brought together in, in that sort of process. Could I, could I add on to that? So, and Paul can probably say a bit on this as well. So our experience, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll preface this and say that I'm, I'm very proud to say we've never been to VCAT because we've always come to a position without getting, let's say, too acrimonious. Um, I'm sure there's people out there that don't want to send me Christmas cards, but that, that's, that's okay. Um, the work, when we work with multiple groups and stakeholders, um, it's challenging. Uh, it, it, it's, numerous viewpoints that need to be done. There is sometimes a feeling that you're on a, you're talking to people that are a, a human Mobius strip. It just keeps going around in circles. Um, and there is, there is a lot of skepticism sometimes we see between council and government and various other authorities, which can get quite challenging to do. Look, the point I'm trying to make is that Collaboration is important and it has to be done because that's the only way anything gets done. But, um, and Paul will probably attest to this, even the way we collaborate, because I see OMAs as collaborating, not just, you know, my consultant. Um, it can sometimes be um, not very neat and pretty. It is sometimes a bit of a, a drunken embrace, um, you know, when they're flicking the lights off saying last drinks, right? Uh, so, but it takes a bit of patience and, and work um, and, and if it is genuine collaboration there's, there's sort of has to be um, a, a position that not everyone feels like they've, they've gotten what they wanted out of it, if that makes sense. I, I want to just jump in too. I think it's really interesting that you talk about um, that you're in it for the long term yeah. and so... Uh, that therefore embeds a long-term view in the work that you do and therefore, you know, it's important that you maintain respectful relationships with... 100%, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, yeah. And, and that's great. I think that's a really um, interesting ingredient in a, a development process is having, well, skin in the game for the long term. Yeah. And I think, yeah, and it's... You can't burn relationships. No, you can't, but there's also a level of, you know, you, you hope that the other parties are also, you know, don't have to have skin in the game, but, but are equally as committed, right? So um, am I allowed to tar and feather a little bit more? If you like. <laughs> We're make recording it. it yeah. Make it interesting. <laughs> whatever. Sue me. Um, whatever to preserving relationships. Though. We are preserving <laughs> relationships. But, well, it's all facts, right? I'm not making stuff up or, or whining. But like to take your point, um, Judy. So we, we've, you know, um, we arranged on our call uh, once to um, go to the OVGA um, with council to have some. Um, will basically determine the merits of the design and the idea, right? And the OVGA aren't a statutory body, so it's 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 a, it's an advisory body, and it's you know, um, the disappointing part was no one in the OVGA actually went out to site prior to um, the discussion. So, skinning the game is very important, and it's not just from an economic sense; it's turning up seeing what you're actually talking about before you're actually talking about it, so. Uh, um, I might have one final question for the panel and then open to the audience. But, um, Jane, I wanted to come back to your point about collaborating with the university. We've talked about collaborating between 
different um, you know, disciplines and design partners. But how do you, I mean, this was really your PhD, wasn't it? That, that there should be a more um, collaborative and dynamic, um, I guess, relationship between government and uh, university like this one. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm speaking from a very public service point of view, but we're about to see massive cuts because um, uh, both federally and at a state level, we've got some real fiscal challenges ahead. Um, we have the universities have this rich talent pool of students, new ideas from all over the country. And I reckon one of our biggest challenges, and I, I'm just going to use this opportunity to go sideways for a bit. I reckon there's a real snobbery about anti outer suburbs. And um, I love getting in Ubers and speaking to the people, say, where do you come from? What do you think about living out there? I love living out there. I would never move into an apartment in the inner city. So wherever you live in Melbourne or regional Victoria, we want it to be a great place to live. Um, I think that the university reflects our population demographic much more than bureaucracy. There's a um, pretty well-renowned um, uh, senior bureaucrat, Fran Thorne, and she said, just watch out, most of you live within eight kilometres of the inner city and uh, you've got no idea what's going on in the rest of the suburbs. And what the university offers is both that incredible international perspective to challenge the way we approach living, um, you know, compared to living in India, China, Hong Kong, wherever you come from. Um, so to challenge our thinking that we think is normal, um, to bring new ideas. But I also, I, I spent time at Arab, that idea about integrated urbanism was all about bringing back, bringing together diversity, the professional skills together to have that multi-perspective view. And of course, that's what the faculty has, so. Well, we'd love to work with you, sounds <laughs> great. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Okay, let's take some, have we got any hands? We'll take some questions from the uh, faces in the crowd. Alan. Over here, Rosanna, thank you. The man in white. Just to follow up on that, Jane, and thanks to the panel, great um, presentations. Yesterday, uh, New South Wales government announced 1.6 million um, investment into the future of young planners. So every council in New South Wales can apply for $25,000 funding for a planning cadet. So um, quite an incredible investment into the future of planning. And this might be quite a controversial one, Jane, but do you think we've got enough design um, sensibility in our planning courses. Um, is that where one of the problems lies? Mm. Uh, uh, one of the discussions I sit on the Urban Design Review Board and one of the discussions we've been having is um, make it, and I was just speaking to Judy about it before this session, is while we really want to have that core competency in planning, it's really, really important planners understand construction, they understand urban design, they understand architecture, they understand economics. Um, I think everyone here would have had a meeting. One of the things in my job, I used to go to the counter at the Yarra City Council, which um, a lot of the people there were, would get incredibly angry at planning. When I went there, it had the longest time to um, process a planning permit and they were distraught because they were being asked to do things that you couldn't do. So planners need to be able to think three-dimensionally, but they need to understand the economics. I think that point, which I think planners don't like to hear, and I don't like to hear, there is a fear, and you know, often a solution will be make more rules, make more rules, and of course, more rules means that there's more mistakes usually made. <laughs> Um, and the consequences are not known. So it is, you know, that's what the IVGA was there to do, to, I think, free up and mm. ensure that that creativity and looking at things from a different perspective was provided. But, yeah, I think you've got to have your core competency, whether you're in architecture, building, planning, um, urban economics, but you really need to understand those other disciplines so that you can integrate them and see it from their perspective. Thanks, Jane. I'm going to add something there. Yeah, please. The, the, you can't, I, as an architect, and I look at these pictures of the suburbs, and we all see it, I kind of ask the question, because we haven't 
you know, we're looking at some very specific things for the client here. Um, about Viv, just project. call me Viv. Viv. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Viv. Um, but how do they get through the gate? You know, there's a procurement model problem. Like, if, if you say, if you're critical of those types of developments, and say that there's not enough open space, and they're all grey roofs, and there's not enough. Why is there 150 millimetres between two gutters? Then the question has to be asked: What has to be done so that that doesn't occur? Well, well, I guess that's the question, isn't it? Is it more rules, or is that the is that the way to change that, or is it better ideas? And I guess you've put on the table some better ideas from elsewhere. Well, look, there may be an guess... approach is to take a you know you've got to make some step forward. Yeah. And our uh, planning's there. It's got a regime which needs to kind of like set a few rules. But, you know, some of these things might require some precinct planning strategy. So, like the idea, I think of, you know, taking these 1980 suburbs and densifying. A, might need to start with a little baby step by doing a couple of pockets, see if they work. You know, maybe they will. Yeah. Maybe they won't. Um, but I get. I, th I think that's right. And I. I mean, that's certainly how I feel about this space. Is that it's um, under researched, under theorised, under designed um I, I don't, yeah <laughs> well i don't the know i don't think you there. can i don't think there. i don't think you can i don't think there are that's like what i'm that's what i'm saying i guess you know we, we talk about climate change and for example as another example of a big difficult challenge we've kind of known how to deal with that for a long time like we need to decarbonize we need to restore ecology excuse me um, with the suburbs, I don't think we actually have the ideas yet. We have some, we need some more. We've been going on about density for a long time, but actually, how does it hit the ground? We're not very good at these things. So I think there's a, I think there is a big role for designers to come up with new ideas as well as to work hard on how they're delivered and how they're, how they're actually rolled out. Yeah. Can I, can I just add, I also think now a friend of mine just had been living in Bali and someone else will know what the term is, but there are all these tech nomads and they're on their on their laptops they're going to cafes they're living i think we're we're thinking backwards about and providing what's in the past for our population in the future and i don't think we're thinking about and there was a future homes project that was run with ivga melbourne uni and um, planning and it, so i totally agree with you it's actually having some typologies, but also having some experiments. So the thing, one of the things I love about what New South Wales has been doing is they've been finding sites and um, they've been putting new typologies into those sites proximate to transit, testing it. And like it might go wrong, but we've got to try alternatives, don't we? Subtle stick, I think, you know, when we're designing buildings, we're thinking at the individual room scale and the city scale. So in one sense, I'm thinking uh, from the inside out and the outside in. So where's that living space? How does it relate to the neighbour? Where does that relate to the street? How does it relate to the park, the gardens, the landscape, the city? Uh, but at the same time, I could, I could reverse that thinking, and we do. We're looking at what's the planning arrangement, what's the functional relations between A and B, how, what are the networks that get to that thing? Are they big enough? Are they small enough? Do we need other sub-networks? So you kind of like keep working in an architect's brain, or my architect's brain, I'm sure that those in the room are thinking like that, we're, we're thinking at city scale right down to, as I said, the waterproofing detail. I'm gonna take Can another I question. Can question from Jay, to Jane? Um, <laughs> oh, is there a question? We've only sorry. asked one question and it was yeah. Alan. We've gotta get some more yeah. hands. <laughs> Here we go, thanks. Sorry, Jude. No, no, no. I just wanted to ask a quick question about um, joining existing sites together or sort of site amalgamation, if you like. Because um, when you think about the, the suburbs, a 600 square metre block, and then you turn it into townhouses, it ends up being a lot of driveway. So just if folks had any thoughts on, on that specific issue. Do you want to do that one, Viv? Yeah, I'm going to say you've asked the question, you know the answer. Yeah, it's an issue because that's exactly what Jane was saying as well on the Tarnade example. Look, everybody wants density, right? It's the right thing to do. But you plan for X and you end up with X plus Y and that's going to cause more issues. And, and then it also relates to Judy's presentation about 
you know, um, groundwater and trees and nature. And, you know, if it's all driveway, then we're doing it wrong. So I think the car is the big, is the big the, question. I, I think it, this yeah. is the, the, the bigger issue is also about social shift because we live in a society where we expect to have a driveway at our front door. Now we actually have two. And that, um, we ha you know, look at those Dutch examples. I mean, they've got an incredible network of bikeways and pathways that uh, allow for this sort of passive transport mode. And they park their cars not next to their house, down the road a bit. So there's a kind of complete social shift of what the expectation is of what should be your door. That would door. fly here? No. <laughs> but, so, well, no, but you won't get change. No, no, I'm saying... As a planner, yeah, if you want right. to enact change as an authority, as um, a gov in governance, it, 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 without shifting a kind of perception. It's, it's a great comment because yeah. it's you, you, you're doing good, but you, there's other things that are going to occur with it, and clearly no one agrees. And, <laughs> so. and I mean, I think it does... You know, we've talked about um, trying experiments to densify um, and, and to retrofit. And that's one of the things that I was going to ask Jane, you know, in the New South Wales example, how did, how did they navigate potential um, local opposition to changing the, the sort of status quo, the business as usual approach, which is what we need to do, yeah. Um, so I understand just, I've spoken to the New South Wales government people, so we all have a different perspective. Um, they manage the amenity, they pick sites that where you can manage the interface and the amenity of the adjacent property so that you're not building and all of a sudden they've got, they're in a two storey or one bedroom, one storey house and then you've got a huge, so they pick their sites carefully to pick winners. Um, thanks Jane. We've got another question up here. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah, my question had, is probably more of a meta out side question to do with who's the shareholder ultimately in this context and I'm saying this in terms of I'm interested in Paul's uh, concept of how this works with designers involved in the very beginning before you even get to a, a thing called a PSP but also um, the scale of um, investors or shareholders that are involved in this model and the implications of trying to drive that from um, the inside out as a designer. Are you referring to the particular project of the uh, Viv and Paul, or? Oh, look, there's two. Yeah, look, there's probably two different scales here. Yeah, um, the first one is first of all, when you're talking about these um, suburban rollouts, what shareholder model is it? Is it like funded by global shareholding or particular companies? Right. Where's or, the money coming from? Where's the money coming from? Because okay. that's really one of the sensitivities. And the background for me is having tried this back in. Uh, the 2000s um, was really dealing with a mega regional retail centre and trying to change the yeah. model, which is what's happening now. But when you're looking at something of this scale, it's one thing to deal with it as an individual site and negotiating that. But what is happening in the first instance to actually even have this model just rolled out in the way it is and how do you deal uh, with I, that? Uh, yeah. I, I might try and answer that if, and then someone here can correct me if that's okay because I'm trying to get through another couple of questions. Would I be right to say that there's a lot of state government money to do the infrastructure and then a lot of um, private development money to build the houses, but it's a very rickety house of cards, as we've seen with Porter Davis. They're collecting uh, deposits and then they're starting to build, and if the things go up, then they collapse. Uh, I'll say, so from yeah. the beginning, land gets rezoned, and so the government does that, and the landowners, which they might have speculated and they might have purchased, thinking this is going to be rezoned, this is going to be rezoned for growth. Um, so probably on all fringe areas, the next we've got an urban growth boundary. A number of governments have said it'll be set, it won't grow, but it grows. Um, I heard we're about probably 30, 35 years away from filling out the urban growth boundary. But that's the first transaction. And then the developers, it's a range of developers, some big developers like Stocklands and then some smaller developers. Um, my understanding of the PSP process is often the larger landowners like Stocklands um, will um, work with VPA, who are the Victorian Planning Authority that do the structure planning work as an agency of government. They have a board. Um, they often will, um, the, the landowners will put forward money to pay for that work to be done. And then the 
very quickly, sorry, the, um, there's an infrastructure contribution that contributes to the local roads, the council puts in money, and I think there's an emerging gap. Without sequencing, that infrastructure doesn't get built cons consecutively. So that's where we've got these problems in the roads at the moment. So it's many, <laughs> um, state, and, and the state of course hopes the federal government will provide funds to top up that infrastructure gap. I promise I won't repeat what Jane said, but yes, it's the state. And whilst the VPA does talk to private owners, it is generally the state that will determine it. They're obliged to talk to them, but ultimately the state, the VPA will determine what's going to go where and how. They'll take submissions from council, from various authorities, environmental groups, yeah, mum and dads, whoever. Thanks, Viv. I'm gonna, let's do one last question. You can come and catch them after. I, I hope they'll, I'm sure they won't mind. Um, but we're running out of time. We've got a hand right here in the front. Thanks, Jasmine. I just, um, had a question about the um, uh, services such as retail and commercial space, uh, childcare centres and the like. Um, and uh, I'm curious to know what the panelists view is about how, how we're performing in that area at the moment, because I have seen some examples over the years where I've gone out to a new estate and I've seen a map with a future school or a future this and what have you. And it leaves me wondering, well, what, what, what if it never happens? There was a bit of um, media last year about Thornhill Park. And that was a little bit different because that related to an overpass that hadn't been built. And people had um, bought into that. Uh, an estate there um, with the reasonable expectation that that would occur within a reasonable period of time, uh, which it didn't. So, um, yeah, I'm just curious how we currently performing uh, in that area, um, in the uh, Greenfields uh, estates, uh, and what could we do better? So I know that the VPA works pretty closely with uh, councils and the Department of Education to roll out schools as quickly as possible. but without sounding brutal about it, it is literally about numbers. So for a retail centre to work, if you've got a big box that's got a, starts with C or W, they need around about six to 8,000 people living there to actually make sense to be there. It's, it's, it's just the way it works. So what you've asked really hits another issue is timing. Like how do you time and sequence these things? It's a bit of a chicken and an egg. Obviously, you want all of these things there, childcare, medical, shopping, parks, etc. but they can't happen until people start moving. And are people going to move there if it's not there? So it's, again, I'm not giving you an answer by just saying, but it's it's <laughs> difficult. No, and, and that's right. And if you're, a, um, if you're living there, none of those issues probably matter to you do they you know yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. i was well, on, yeah that these yeah. these huge uh, what dolores hayden calls growth machines which build these cities and yeah. de determine all the services how they land on you as a as a resident is a very uh, challenging thing uh, i was um, driving i think wednesday evening i was listening i was in the car listening dear old auntie was having talk back on the abc and then there was a comment about i've lived here for you know three years and they promised a uh, a, a full medical centre, like a full hospital, and that's happened. But without naming the area, I know for the fact there's like 4,000 people that have moved there. It's not, it, it's it's not viable to have that there. That's that's the brutal fact, right? Whether it's public infrastructure or private, uh, until population keeps growing, and it is, it just takes time. It's a big discussion. Oh, there's, I'm getting lots of hands about a question up here. So I, I really, if it's a quick one and it's urgent, I'll take it. It's all urgent. It's very urgent. I wrote it down to be extra quick. Okay, good. Um, it's about transit-oriented development. Oh, this is a big one. This is a big one. I, honestly, you're going to have to come and talk to them after. You can grab Jane. Transit-oriented development is a whole other topic. I, I, it, we're already 20 minutes over, 10 minutes over, and I know it's design week. I am going to wrap it up. I'm very sorry. Um, I want to say, I know it's cruel, but I, I, I'm, I'm speaking for the whole room. Um, I want to say Have a big thank you. Have a look at Brigance, got a great <laughs> Todd. <laughs> a big thank Austria. you to Jane, to Judy, to Paul, to Viv, to uh, Melbourne Uni for hosting us, to Melbourne Design Week. Thanks to all of you for coming very quickly. Um, oh yeah, that's a good moment. Thanks to all of you for coming.
while you're here, while you're here, there are a couple of other things happening in the building. Ground floor in the Dulux Gallery, fantastic exhibition of landscape architecture uh, in Japan, beautiful videos. And up on level one is the Social Impact Awards shortlist exhibition, which is the blue Bunnings paper everywhere. Um, have a good weekend. Thanks for coming.